here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is Matt Bartolini, Head of Spider Americas Research at State Street Global Advisors. We are talking about the market outlook and uh, ETF strategies for the second half of 2023. Matt, welcome back. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Great to be here. So this has been an interesting year. The S&P 500 entered a new bull market last week, uh, but many investors have still remained on the sidelines. In fact, flows into U.S. equity ETFs have been really anemic this year, while billions of dollars have gone into money market funds. And the S&P 500 is up about 15% year to date, while the Nasdaq has surged about 38 percent and the rally is just being driven by mega cap stocks uh, that have mainly benefited from optimism about AI. So the consensus view late last year was that the first half of 2023 would be very challenging for stocks uh, in anticipation of a recession and then it would be followed by a recovery in the second half. But it seems that stocks have continued to climb the wall of worry. So I wanted to start with your thoughts on the market performance this year. Were you surprised? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, we have an environment where um, earnings trends are not really supportive of broad-based gains. And I guess I would even probably caveat the broad-based nature of it, because as you pointed out, the gains have been pretty myopic. It's the markets, you know, S&P 500 has been marked by some pretty narrow leadership. I mean, as it stands right now, you know, roughly 26% of S&P 500 firms are beating the S&P 500 benchmarks return this year. That's the lowest rate ever in 40 years of reliable data that I have. Uh, that's a, a weaker hit rate than in 1998 and 1999 leading up to the dot-com bubble. And you see the top five stocks contributing, you know, the most of their return uh, of the S&P 500 return that they have, you know, in almost two decades. So it's a little bit surprising how in the face of continued rising rates from the Federal Reserve that a lot of these mega cap growth stocks um, have really powered the marketplace because last year in 2022, those are some of the, the losers of this, you know, change in the interest rate environment. So I think this the performance trend that we've seen is a little bit surprising. I'd also say it's probably not inherently sustainable, just given how narrow that market leadership has been. So you think that there's a disconnect between markets and the macroeconomic outlook uh, uh, because there's no dearth of uncertainties and risks this year. And we know that inflation has come down lately, but it still remains at elevated levels it is expected to remain sticky and we just heard from a super hawkish fed they are now forecasting two additional rate hikes uh, this year even though they uh, held rates unchanged at this meeting which was expected uh, so do you see a disconnect there why stocks have gone up so much whereas macroeconomic outlook remains challenging yeah, so I, I, there's definitely a disconnect, not only from the macroeconomic picture, but just from the fundamental picture. I mean, we still see more downgrades relative to upgrades from an earnings perspective. Uh, if we look at it, you know, over the full year, earnings expectations for full year 2023 earnings per share growth has declined. And right now it's looking looking at, you know, just about a 1% year over year growth rate by the time the 2023 is over. Also, we've had negative year-over-year -year, uh, earnings um, per share growth in Q4 of 2022, Q1 of 2023, and we're gonna, about to kick off uh, Q2 2023 earnings in about a month, and that's forecasted to be negative. So three consecutive quarters of negative earnings growth, yet the S&P 500, you know, as you noted, is up double digits and you know, is actually you know, back in bull market territory territory because it's it rallied 20% off of its bottom. 
But then you also juxtapose this performance against, you know, what is continuing to be somewhat of a mixed, but sluggish, more sluggish than not, economic picture. If you look at the LEI, so the Conference Board Leading Economic Indicators, it has declined for 10 consecutive months. That has never happened outside of 2009 and 1975, I believe. So pretty rare, um, an anomalous type of weakening in the economic environment is, as we know, when that LEI turns negative, it signifies a slowdown. And typically, when we get to these type of levels, it also coincides with a recession. And we also see the yield curve is inverted. But also within the LEI, there's something called the diffusion index, which looks at the number of, of those indicators that are declining or rising. And right now, roughly 70% of those indicators are in a declining state. So the market's return this year has really, again, climbed that wall of worry around sluggish earnings and economic activity. So you mentioned uh, some signals indicating an impending recession. And uh, in fact, since late last year, most economists uh, have been telling us that a recession is just around the corner. Yet so far, the U.S. economy continues to avoid a recession and the consumer also has uh, remained resilient. So what is uh, your forecast? Do you think that the U.S. can avoid a recession or is a recession imminent? So, you know, I think for me personally, one of the things that I'm looking at is the labor market. The labor market continues to remain strong. The consumer continues to remain resilient. And as we know, the consumer makes up roughly 70% of all sort of economic activity. And if we look at the most recent GDP report, we see the inflation adjusted uh, final purchases of domestic goods, which is a really strong indicator of aggregate demand. That will grow by about 3.2%, which was the highest uh, figure since May of 2021. And at the same time, the labor market, look at the employment to prime age population ratio. That's at highs. Um, that ratio is at highs all the way back to 2001. So well above where it was pre-pandemic. And then you also have a job openings uh, from the jobs report, which is above the pre-pandemic highs as well. So there's still a lot of room for the labor market to tighten further and, and job growth and wage growth to continue to accelerate overall economic activity. And the consumer's balance sheets still remain relatively healthy. I mean, the savings rate has increased. Uh, Inflation-adjusted disposable income has increased in the most recent reports. And then you also have credit card balances that continue to move higher, but delinquencies have not. So the labor market is really strong at this point. And it's re- I think it's really hard to have a full-scale recession if the labor market is this strong. And what I think is interesting is that this idea of a recession, and, you know, are we going to have one or are we not, has was really kicked off last year around springtime when the yield curve first inverted, because there's the academic paper around the yield curve typically predates a recession by six to 24 months. And if we look at when the yield curve inverted last uh, last year, it did it for like a day or two in April, but then persistently inverted around June 2022. So fast forward to today of June 2023, and we're kind of in the middle of that six to 24 month window. So, um, you know, if you're an optimist, you can say, well, at the halfway point, the half, you know, half the glass is half full, um, and you know the labor markets can power us through uh, any recessionary tendencies. If you're a pessimist, you can say, well, I still got a couple more months left. And the LEI hasn't been wrong since 1960, and the yield curve hasn't been wrong since 1960. Um, But so I think, you know, you really, in this type of marketplace, you kind of want to just diversify those recession risks a little bit. But I think you prepare for either a very, very shallow and brief and narrow recession. Uh, But, you know, odds are, if the labor market remains as strong, I, I think the U.S. economy cannot Um, enter a recession as defined by the uh, NBER. So tell us how investors uh, should position their portfolios uh, for the second half. Yeah, so I think the first part is moving up in quality and rotating overseas. So, you know, as mentioned earlier, earnings sentiment and earnings quality in the U.S. is pretty poor. You know, consistent downside revisions, uh, more downside 
versus relative to upside. Uh, and at the same time, you have valuations that are relatively stretched. Uh, so owning you know quality value stocks can potentially help in that regard. Uh, you can tamp down some of the valuations. You can infuse some fundamental durability into a portfolio where you know there's some fundamental weakness. But I think one of the more attractive areas is just going overseas. So while I said that earlier, only about 26% or so uh, S&P 500 stocks are outperforming uh, the actual S&P 500, that's very different overseas. There is better breadth, uh, so to speak, roughly about 49%, so almost half of um, international developed XUS stocks are outperforming the MSCI EFA index in its own right. So there's better breadth, better leadership. Uh, also overseas, there's better uh, earning sentiment, uh, pretty much led by Europe. Uh, within Europe, over the last three months, uh, there's been stronger upside revisions. There's actually been more upside revisions than downside revisions uh, in Europe and particularly outside the U.S. as well. So I think just going overseas can help uh, also infuse some more fundamental strength because that stronger breadth, stronger sentiment is also met with more attractive valuations both on a relative perspective, but also uh, in the absolute terms, you know, when you look at developed ex-US equities relative to itself. You know, when I say go overseas, it's mainly staying in the developed area, so um, developed ex-US. So, right, uh, we have seen a lot of interest in international stock ETFs uh, this year, and uh, in fact, uh, they have done well too. Uh, international stocks, uh, we know that they underperformed the U.S. Uh, stocks, U.S. major indexes for the last so many years. But uh, starting late last year, they kind of started rebounding and uh, their valuations still look attractive. You like Europe. Uh, Japanese stocks have done quite well this year and we have seen some decent inflows into Japanese stock ETFs as well, particularly the hedge ones. Uh, but you don't like Japan a lot. And uh, what about the emerging markets? You don't like them because of uh, this uh, anemic recovery in China and uh, continued regulatory concerns? So I think one of the big reasons why we're, you know, we're not so uh, high on China, or not even China, on emerging markets is just from an earnings picture. Uh, earnings uh, for this year forecast would be negative. Sentiment is significantly weak. Uh, momentum is relatively poor as well. The only thing uh, EM has going for are valuations. And perhaps they're cheap for a reason. So if we're looking at a value case, I'd rather buy some areas of the market that are uh, attractive on a valuation case, but also have strong earning sentiment. And that just is developed XUS with a specific acute focus to Europe as well. Right. All good points. So you another major theme is uh, diversifying recessionary risks with cyclicals and defensives. Tell us about it and how investors can position their portfolios. Yeah, so I mean, this goes to this sort of myopic duality of outcomes. You know, it's, it's either a recession or not. Um, and, you know, if you're in that recessionary pessimistic camp, then owning things like gold, which have done well in past recessions since the 1970s when gold was you know, um, allowed to float freely. Um, and then also just low volatility equities. You know, if there's a recession or if leadership all of a sudden reverses because of significant fears of economic turmoil or just, you know, really pointed economic sluggishness, uh, low volatility equities, you know, when when the market is in drawdowns, have historically outperformed. I can look at some of the worst, you know, 10 months or 20 months or just even on average when the, when the broader market falls. So that's one way to sort of diversify that recessionary risk um, on the downside. But if you're, we're able to, if you're in the camp of the optimist, where you do believe that the labor market is strong enough to juice the economy through, owning cyclical sectors that have a consumer focus to them could be a potentially attractive. So we like home builders. Um, obviously, you know, housing formation continues to remain strong. Uh, we've seen um, some rebounding in certain confidence metrics, whether it's consumer sentiment confidence, but also home builders earnings. Uh, there's been uh, hot, more upgrades relative to downgrades uh, over the last few months, and those numbers have increased for home builder stocks. Also, home builder stocks this past quarter 
they had stronger earnings than the broader market. But yet, since they were sort of thrown out in 2022, because uh, they had such poor returns, valuations are also attractive. So you have this environment for home builders where earnings sentiment is, is improving, earnings growth is stronger than the market, but valuations are not. And if you know they're, they're sort of trading below perceived fair value, so if the economy is able to remain powerful and avert a recession, you know, there could be some uh, you know, tailwinds associated with home builders. The other is transportation. Uh, you know, within uh, the transportation industry, you roughly have about half associated to passenger travel. Passenger travel continues to rebound. As I said earlier, consumers' balance sheets remain healthy. Savings rates are up. Disposable income on an inflation-adjusted basis is, is improving and, and positive. Um, and, you know, we see uh, global travel, passenger travel, roughly, you know, 97% of what it was um, in 2019. So that's also another area where valuations, because transportation stocks were so impacted by the weak return environment in 2022, there's been some dislocation to fair value, and their valuations are also attractive. Right, uh, transport and home builders, both very interesting areas. And home, bin- home builders have actually done quite well this year. They have significantly outpaced the S&P 500 uh, index despite rising rates. And the housing market has not collapsed. It's uh, continues to do well, uh, despite all the forecasts for housing collapsing with the rising mortgage rates. And... Uh, Another area which has uh, seen a lot of interest this year is fixed income EDFs. And one of the reasons is that uh, yields are at levels which were not seen since the financial crisis. So there are still investors who want to invest in bond ETFs uh, for income, but they want to balance their risk. Uh, Tell us what they can do. Yeah, so fixed income broadly, you know, on a relative to stocks perspective is attractive. So if we get the earnings risk premium of stocks relative to bonds that has fallen to levels that indicate really weak subsequent returns for equities. So on a relative value basis, bonds are attractive. And I think some of the more attractive areas because you know while yields have gone up within fixed income to levels that are roughly in the 80th percentile over the last 25 years or so, volatility has also spiked. Uh, day over day changes in um, the returns on bonds are at elevated levels. So if we look at the rolling standard deviation returns on a 90-day basis for the AG, uh, for the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index, it's in the 99th percentile. And I think even just today's action post-Fed meeting, we see a pretty knee-jerk reaction in the rates market because we have this evolution of monetary policy where we've had aggressive rate hikes. Now we're having potentially a skip or a pause and then further ones. And there's a lot of uncertainty. So while bonds are or attractive from a relative return perspective, their volatility has also increased. So how do you balance that income slash return potential with increased risks? Uh, it's you know, focusing on some of the ultra short and short duration bond markets where you can potentially get a yield because of how inverted the yield curve is, a yield greater than the ag, but because you're not taking on as much duration, which is a risk, uh, you can get a yield that is greater than the ag, but you know, in some cases, you know, 80, 90 percent less volatile um, than than we get in the ag as well. So you know, we we like some of the active, um, the ability to be active on that ultra short space because there's different securitized credits uh, within the within mortgages or other, uh, you know, whether it be auto loans or housing loans, what have you, uh, to generate some more yield and diversify some of those risks. Very interesting. Now let's talk about EDF inflows, which I mentioned have been anemic this year, despite uh, this very impressive market performance. Uh, Particularly U.S. equity ETFs have seen very small inflows this year. Bond ETFs have seen more interest from investors. And I know that you track ETF flows very, very closely. So tell us about your thoughts on inflows and also tell us about the recent uh, turn in that sentiment. Uh, Did you see a shift in sentiment uh, recently from uh, very bearish to bullish? So, you know, at the end of May, or actually in the month of May, I should say, roughly, I think like 40 or so, 45% or so, of all ETFs had inflows. That's well below the historical rate of 
uh, basically two thirds of all ETFs having inflows in a given month. So while um, the market itself has narrow leadership and weak breadth, so did inflows, which sort of shows this lack of conviction and some hesitancy as well to fully buy into this rally. Uh, since then, if we look at equity flows through the first you know 14 days of the month, equities have taken in $23 billion. And a lot of that has been geared towards US equities and largely into large caps, um, which I think, you know, more broadly just kind of speaks to a little bit of a catch up trade. You know, uh, the leadership has been so narrow. I think a lot of investors have been sitting on the sidelines because they didn't really believe in these returns. Uh, and they're a little bit uh, caught off guard as with some potentially underweight. And now we're starting to see some flows come back in because you know returns continue to go higher. See if they'll stick is the biggest question. But I think if we look on a more trend line basis, you know what we can see is on a year to date perspective, fixed income funds have taken in ninety two billion dollars. Equity funds have taken in ninety three billion dollars. So all else equal, there's been actually an increased allocation to fixed income because on a year to date basis, those fixed income flows equate to 7% of start of year assets, while those 90, you know, 3 billion only equate to about 1.8% of equity start of year assets because equity ETFs, that market's 5.7 trillion on fixed income is only 1.4 trillion, give or take. So the 90 billion into fixed income in you know less than six months is really speaks to the potential return opportunity you have in fixed income. Right. Um, regarding inflows, recent inflows into equity ETFs, uh, uh, we know that investors often mistime their exit or re-entry into the market. And it's quite possible that they will now chase the rally when it's too late. That remains to be seen. But uh, very interesting and excellent stuff, Matt. Thanks, as always, for sharing your insights and thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. That was Matt Bartolini of State Street Global Advisors. Now let's talk about some EDFs that you could consider if you like those strategies. Uh, so let's talk about some implementation ideas. So he talked about uh, focusing on quality at a reasonable price. So State Street offers um, an excellent ETF. The ticker symbol is SDY. It is the Spider S&P Dividend ETF. And this looks at stocks that have uh, 20 years of consistently raising their dividends. Uh, so they have high income payouts as also sustainability of those payouts. Uh, the ticker symbol, as I mentioned, is SDY. Another ETF that they offer, uh, which looks at quality uh, at a reasonable price is QUS, the Spider MSCI USA Strategic Factor CDF. This looks at factors like low volatility, quality, and value in a single strategy. Uh, another ETF that I like is by iShares. It is the iShares MSCI USA Quality Factor ETF. The ticker symbol is QUAL. Uh, this is very popular with investors and Heather has gathered a lot of uh, inflows this year. So this looks at factors like high return on equities, uh, stable earnings growth, and low debt to equity uh, relative to peers in each sector. Uh, now he talked about uh, investing in developed X. US and in fact international ETFs have been very popular this year as I mentioned particularly developed uh, international developed market ETFs so the state street ETF uh, worth considering is SPDW spider portfolio developed world X US there's another one uh, which is worth a look it's by Vanguard Vanguard FTSE developed market ETF the ticker symbol is VEA now, uh, for uh, defensive positioning, if you want to look at gold ETFs, the most popular gold ETF is GLD. But uh, for longer term investors, there are cheaper versions, GLDM by State Street and IAUM by iShares. Both, both excellent, very cheap uh, ETFs, very low expense ratio. 
if you want to look at home builders and transportation, the State Street EDFs are XHB for home builders and XDN for transportation. And both these ETFs are equal weighted ETFs. And uh, if you want to prefer, if you want to look at market cap weighted uh, ETFs, then uh, those are by iShares. The ticker symbol is ITB for home builders. Uh, it focuses on home builders and it's quite top heavy due to market cap weighting. Uh, and uh, for transportation, the ETF is IY. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting or tax advice or a recommendation to buy, sell or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.